Yeah, call the meeting to order. At Six o'clock, select board meeting on October 25th. First item on agenda, approval minutes of September 13th, 27th, and October 11th. Second. Second. Okay. All those uh, aye? Yeah. Approved? Aye. Okay. Minutes approved. Uh, comments from the public? Anybody that's here wish to comment other than the scheduled appointments? Well, or you can still comment as the public. Dan? Um, I, only, I didn't see on the agenda an update on the uh, four town meeting on the $3.4 million bond. I didn't know if that was going to get addressed later or not. Yep, later. Okay, um, that's all I have. Oh, Thank you. Yep. Okay, moving on. Uh, scheduled appointments. First one is continuation of the joint poll hearing for Verizon and Eversource on Egypt Road. And do we, either one of them want to come forward and present what you're proposing here? Uh, yeah, would you like me to read the petition again, or you just want me to pick up from where we left off? No, I'll just pick up from where we left off. Um, again, again, for the record, my name is Paul Davis. I work for a company by the, by the name of UC Synergetic out of Sunderland. An engineering contract company doing work for Verizon, and I'm here representing Verizon on their behalf. Um, picking up from where we left off, the last meeting we had here, a couple of weeks ago, I brought together all the parties involved with the polls, the property owners, the Sears that live at number 27, Egypt Road, Eversource, the developer, Walter Thayer, and the superintendent of the uh, DPW. We all went out, took a look at the poll in question. We moved that poll across the street away from the Sears property. So it's across the street now um, in town property, but more towards the developable land that Mr. Thayer wants to develop. So we all came to the agreement that that was best for everybody involved. There was no objections, and that's basically where it stands today. Okay, so the <coughs> drawing we have is dated October 10th, 2017. Is, is correct? Yes. Um, I didn't noticing that the numbers that we got back in August as far as how many feet it was from the center of the Boston Main Railroad tracks is not changed compared to the one that's being summed here. So I guess, how can I tell if the actual statement we're signing corresponds to the map. And I think the map, the map actually looks right given the, um, given this, I looked at the assessor's map on my little laptop here. Um, but the, like the distance from the, the B and O in writing here seems to be the same as it was. Correct. Nothing um, has changed towards the railroad track. The only thing that has changed is on the petition is pulled VZ 13 E 15 that used to be across the street. Now it's across the street on the other side. That's the only thing that's changed on the petition. And so the measurements, the only to... measurements that have changed are from the existing pole, pole VZ 12 E 14, and the measurement from the pole in question, or the, the, the problem pole. VZ13, VZ15 uh, e to VZ14, E16. Those two measurements are the only measurements that have changed. Yeah, yeah. but I, what I'm noticing is that the, the measurements you gave us back in August yeah. are the same as what's on the thing you want us to sign. So I don't know if the thing you actually want us to sign matches the actual map, the, the revised map that has the locations that you agree. As far as I know, the measurements that are on the petition today are accurate. So even though the map has changed and the numbers have not, you're saying that they're accurate? Correct. The measurements have not changed. The measurements haven't changed, although the locations of the poles have changed. No. I teach physics, so I'm really good at this. All right. 
If you look at the petition, mm -hmm. the only two measurements that have changed uh -huh. are from the existing pole, mm -hmm. VZ12, E14, mm -hmm. to the new location of the pole that was the problem. Mm -hmm. That measurement of 165 feet, that's a changed measurement. The other measurement that has changed is from the pole that was the problem pole, VZ13, E15, the 150 foot measurement to that second proposed pole, mm -hmm. VZ14, E16, that has changed. It's not 150 anymore? It's 150 the way it sits now. Okay. All other measurements on that petition have not changed since the last meeting. Have not changed. We didn't move any of those. Okay. No, I understand that. But the thing that you're asking us to sign mm -hmm. has, it says it's 260 feet easterly from the center line of Boston and Main Road. 385 feet easterly, 535 feet easterly, 685 feet easterly. And are those the same on the last petition? Those are the same as the one that I've got dated August 24th. Which but they're the same. Those are the same numbers. Because they don't, because you, I mean, the, the way it's stated, it isn't um, 150, 65 feet from the existing pole and so on. Are the, is the last two, the 535 and the 685, is that the same as well? 535 and 685? Yes. They are. 535 and 685 are the same on both of those. They're the same. Okay, I guess I'd like to see what you're talking about. I, are you looking at something different than what's in the package here? Yeah, this is well, the... I've got the package, okay, but what are you looking at? That's the revision that's the, as of today. That's, that's the revision as of today. today. But it looks like the same thing as last night. Okay, so the, the first the first pull is 260 feet, that's the same. Okay, the 3, 385 is the same. The 535 is the same. The 685 is the same. Right. And this was when these two poles were located in other places. And Joyce's point is the measurements cannot be the same poles that moved. But you're going from the center of the, of the tracks. It, it, they don't necessarily say the same point from the tracks. So you could go up and down and still be the 685 out. Well, I, I, I'm not hearing that from these folks. And it could be by complete coincidence that there's another distance that's relevant here that happens to match on those. But you've moved the poles, but not changed the actual distance. On and the, and the pole has side. gone closer to the tracks than the prior. Yeah. That's the, so I don't, I don't see how it can be the same. Okay. <clears throat> From my recollection of being there, all the pole all the measurements are from the tracks to the to the mm -hmm. east. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so that last pole is still going to be the same distance. It's just going to be on the opposite oh, side, of the, side road. of the road. Yeah. So, so the measurement right. should still be the same from the railroad tracks as it was originally, except now instead of it being on the the mm -hmm. north northerly side of the road, it's going to be on the east or the southerly so you're side of the road. saying that this one was directly across. Correct. And this one was directly across. Correct. So you had three of them on one side of the road. We took the problem pole and we moved it directly straight across the street. Straight across. Mm hmm Okay. One pole. That's it. Okay. So and that was the pole that the Sears were okay. requesting not be in their lawn. Okay, so what you're, what you're saying here is, is correct and these are the right dimensions. Yeah, I don't have the old. I don't have the old. That's my understanding. Is we're not changing the distance to the road tracks. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. Just, uh, anyway, so. Yeah, he's got the he's got the, the previous map. Um, he's going to But, but like I was saying, it, and it says in here it's measured from the center line of the railroad tracks, mm -hmm. and that's the no, vertical distance you don't go along the road. Yeah. 
I understand it. My memory of the previous map was was a little different than what you're saying. I don't remember there being uh, the poles being on the other map where you're saying now, but it's really easy to check because Brian's got the map from the previous meeting. So this would be very, very quick to check. It won't make us why, go over why time. Why do we need to go back to that? That's not what they're proposing. Because so, that's where these measurements came from. Right. But they're okay. saying they're saying these are correct today. And I'm checking them because that's my duty as a public official to maybe check things twice before signing. Oh. Can I ask an unrelated question? I just want to make sure, and it sounds like everyone got together, but, and, and I think it's great that everyone got together. Mr. Thierry, you aren't concerned at all that having two poles in front of lot B will impact its ability to be a marketable lot? No, I was there when, when we met. We all agreed on just moving the pole across the street. And you don't have to impact someone's done deal. No okay. impact to me. Thank okay, because I'm all for people moving to town. They don't you. have enough money. So thank you, sir. <laughs> yep. By the way, I do commend you guys for all getting together. It's awesome. Because it doesn't happen enough. So kudos for what it's worth. Uh, I have a picture are going back to August. You're August 21? Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, because this is... We have a lot of issues, um, issues with that map. There were a lot of issues with this map, and if these are the distances that they're quoting in the letter, this one looks like it's right on the property line over here. That's the distance we're telling them they can put a pole. And uh, we're telling them they can put a pole there. And we're telling them they can put a pole there. That one happens to match. That one looks like it happens to match. Um, and it's not clear to me that the distances line up. But we could do a quick, um, got the assessor's map has a scale on it, has um, uh, 300 feet to an inch. No, it's got a, yeah, this map's not to scale. Um, but this one's got uh, 300 feet gets you to somewhere around here from the railroad tracks. And then it says 260, so that seems about right. The next one, 385, does not seem about right. Um, and that's one that I mean, do you understand where I'm coming from? The, this map came with a certain set of measurements. Okay, and now this map is what you're saying we're doing now, and those poles are in different locations, and they don't look like they're just across the street from from where they were on this map. You said okay. poles as in plural. Yes. We moved one pole. And one. This doesn't quite look like you moved one pole, but. I don't, I mean, I don't know how to fix this other than to say the map is what we want to go by, or do we have to write it out in terms of this is what's signed. that's what gets signed. Okay, but I, I still, I guess, don't see the, the, the difference. The only difference between uh, what they presented earlier, okay, the one pole is, is on the other side, and, and that, that dimension is now 165 instead of... Uh, what you had 175. The other, the other three poles or four poles are the same dimension, other than they're measuring differently from the railroad tracks. So the first one, which before was was 260 with an angle, and now they're saying the first one is is uh, is is two, 260 straight line. I guess not, rather than I'm not trying to kill anyone. I'm trying to make sure that what we actually sign is the same as what you actually agreed to. Because if what we sign is not what you agreed to, they put their polls in the places they wanted to at the beginning, which was upsetting people. Okay? So, I mean, I'm not trying to be a troublemaker. 
although I don't mind being a troublemaker if it's for a good cause. Can I? But it seems, I'm not going to sign this. If you guys want to go ahead and sign it, that's up to you, but I don't think these measurements match what's on this map. Okay? Even though that map is obviously not drawn to scale. It's squished. Yeah. And it's got property lines right. on it. But this property line is something like 400 feet from the tracks here. So, right? Well, that's what you're talking about. So those two are possibly, those order of magnitude, those two look right. The third and fourth one, though, I don't think those are 535 and 685. This 685 would be on here. Well, I, I guess yeah. somebody has, has measured that, that dimension, right? And so if it's that one, here they don't have a scale. Who measured this? I did. You did? Yeah. Was anybody with you? No. no. I have specific latitude, longitude coordinates that I go by. Specific mm -hmm. that are right down to the half a foot. So I the only the only thing I have to say is you keep saying poles. There was mm -hmm. one pole being objective, one. Right, I know. And when we all met, we met at that pole and I walked ninety degrees across the street. Yeah. I understand all of that. that pole. Do you understand what I'm looking at? This is the math you gave us, and you said this was 260, this is 385, this is 585, and this is 600 something. Mm -hmm. Look at this one. The furthest away pole is here. So you're telling me the distance from the, to here to here is the same as the distance from here to here, right? This is where you're saying the new po the, the new pole, the one that you moved across the street is. Yeah. Okay. These are the places where you told me before that this was, you told me before that that was 685 feet. So in August this was 685 feet, and now you're telling me that this one is now 685 feet. And they're different locations. They're in completely different locations. This one's over near this property line, and this one is much closer to this property line. This isn't even correct. I know, this is the map you gave us in August. <laughs> I know, okay, so and that I, I, one, I can't these go measures. by something that's right. not correct. Well, when you gave us this, you gave us these numbers. Okay. But the thing is, again, the, the measurements were taken, and again, we went 90 degrees across across I, the street. I know. And I understand that this, this, is, this isn't even in the right location. And which is why we had a, a, a nice but, talk four weeks but ago. I measured it myself, and whether this is right or not, I didn't have anything to do with this. I didn't. Okay. I didn't design this. So you have I didn't put this on paper. I didn't even put that on paper. Okay. So you them. can't even verify that these numbers are the same as this map. They are the same to what we have today. That's all I can tell you. But okay. So you, can't, you can't. say it's accurate, the same as this map. The measurements are accurate to what we have today. That's all um, I can say about that. To, but it's not accurate to this map. Well, you're, you're talking two different measurements. You're talking in the verbal description from the railroad tracks, and on the map you're showing distance between poles and an angle. So right. the two are never going to agree, right? Because you're measuring from two different points, two different measurements. And mm -hmm. I, I guess if you're, you're telling us that what's in the written description is the accurate dimension of the poles, uh, and that's what it's going to be if you went out again to measure it, you're going to tell us it's the same dimension as in the written description, right? That's what I'm saying, yes. Okay, and I think that's what we should be approving is what is the written description. Whether it matches the map or not, you can't tell because you're measuring two different from two different points, the, the, two different measurements. The, the map is garbage. Right. And yeah. we're all agreed on that. We've been agreed on that for a month and a half. Well, other than it shows the side of the road, yeah, yeah, the poles are, but the distance... I, I guess... I, I, I gotta believe the numbers are, are right, only because I'm hard-pressed to believe that anyone would go out with 
three different parties and not abide by their agreement. It just, mm -hmm. it, it, it's very easy to turn in a piece of paper and not remember to change the numbers. I, I think that I think whoever turned in this, it just turned in the same thing they turned in in August. And all I really want is some kind of confirmation that these numbers match this map, and you're not willing to say that because you didn't produce this map. But yet, this map is the thing that we're we're being told. Right. But is. if you look at the petition plan, there's no measurement from the railroad track to the first pole. And I don't know what that is. I measured from the pole locations to the railroad track. So the missing measurement is from the first pole, which is VZ 16 E 18. I don't have that measurement, and it's not here on the petition. So how do you know what that is? It's on the petition. It's on this. It says one. 260 feet. It says it's 256 feet easterly from the center of the Boston and Maine railroad tracks. OK. Yeah, you don't seem like you can. You said you didn't measure that, so you don't know if that's correct. I didn't say I didn't measure I said on the petition. It's not on the petition. It is. It's, it's on this petition. I'm looking at the picture. But the picture's not what we signed. Right. So this is the petition. The thing I'm holding in my hand. Right. Are, are we signing the picture? Are we signing the picture? No, we're, we're, signing. we're signing this. The petition. The picture has very little to do with what we're talking right. about. Okay, and if he's telling us that these dimensions on the petition are correct, I, I think we, we have to accept that. And the only other thing is go out there ourselves and measure it. I don't mm -hmm. think we're, we're, we need to do well, not that. not tonight. Anytime. I don't think we need to do I, that. I guess you guys can uh, you have a majority and you can pass this if you want to. What I, my main problem is that coming in for a poll hearing and having, well, the first time, a map that's completely unrelated, right, to where you actually want to place the polls, um, and then saying, Here, here's the same piece of paper we gave you in August with a wrong map. I'm sure these ones are right. Um, it really, it's really sloppy. And I don't think I'm going to put my name on it. And you may feel like he's given you enough assurances that what we're signing corresponds to what people have, have agreed where they want these polls to go. Um, I don't have that much confidence. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. So and, and with you know with no, um, so you're so you want him to show, okay, these dimensions, of the 260, 385, and whatever on this map. I. That's that, what you're that's asking. That's the thing we're signing. Show. That's the thing we're signing. And we're signing right? the petition. We're signing that piece of paper. Right. Right. So, and he can't actually verify that those numbers correspond to the poll locations that he's proposing on this map. Except that he didn't produce the map. He just made these other measurements, the 125, the 50, 150, 165. Okay. Okay. So that's, that's my beat. That these might be right numbers. There's nobody in this room who's willing to verify that. Well, he's verifying. He's telling us that these are the numbers. Yeah. And yet, the same numbers they supplied back in August with a completely different map with different locations. Well, the map. The problem is the map. Then. Well, know. how do we know that? Those numbers were submitted that's what with he's the telling, map. That's what he's telling us. And the only way to to verify that is to go out there and actually measure and them. And I'm, I'm shocked and that no one has gone out and made the measurement of the thing we have to sign. That's what I'm hearing. Nobody has made the measurement of the thing they're asking us to sign. So you for mean, all I know, I'm saying from the, the town? The no representative of the town has done that? It doesn't sound like the representative from Verizon has done that. No, he said he did. No. I did that. You just I just you said you didn't make these measurements when I was over there sitting next to you. I told I said I did not draw the petition and I did not put the measurements on the petition. I physically took the measurements by hand the first time I went out to look at this. That's all I can tell you. Right. And you said when you say the measurements, you said you didn't measure anything from the railroad tracks, so though. I took all from measurements from the poles to the railroad track. All measurements. All of them. And that's what's on showing on a petition. That's what I'm saying. Since the Sears and Mr. Thayer are two interested parties here. Pardon? Since you guys 
are the two people who are most impacted by this. Are, are you both comfortable with the, me the, the measurements that he's stating? I'm comfortable with it. Yeah, they moved across the street. I think my uh, neighbors here are, are comfortable, comfortable with people. it. So you're comfortable with us? Actually, it works out better across for us. the street. We go Moving on. it across the street, so. Okay. So you're comfortable with us I'm signing this? Definitely comfortable. And, and you've actually seen the location out there, right? Absolutely. He put markers why it was out there. Yeah. So, so you know where they are. It's not a dimension, <clears throat> it's a location you know. No, they're right there. Okay. Uh, I guess I don't, I don't see us gaining a whole lot by okay. redoing the map again to show another dimension. I'm afraid. Uh, okay. Make a okay. motion. I second I'll, I'll motion. I'll make a motion. I second a motion to approve this poll location proposal. Do a vote of it. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Okay. Who has to sign this? You, you don't have to ask for a post. Anybody opposed? Aye. Okay. There's three copies to sign. So we don't, we don't do anything with these other two. But we sign all three. We got every all three of them. people need copies of it. On the back side? Oh, okay. okay. Those are the same. Okay, moving on, our next scheduled appointment is... Uh, Thank you very much for yeah. taking the time. Lynn Sibley is going to talk about the town's credit card policy. I did, we did make one change to the policy that I sent to you. It's um, item J. So that's different than what we have. This is a new one. So J has changed a little bit. Um, just a, a little bit of background on the credit card policy. Um, in the past, of course, we tried to set up accounts with most of our vendors. As times have changed, most places are now requiring that you um, charge it online. Or if we want to make a, a more economical purchase by going to Amazon or somewhere online to buy something rather than at a... Um, a store where we may have a line of credit, um, we couldn't do that before. Or if we wanted to, an employee would have to use their own personal credit card and then get reimbursed, but they wouldn't get reimbursed the tax from the town, so they would have, the employee would have to eat the tax. So as times have changed, we decided that it was time that the town actually got a credit card. And what I've done is gone through um, my municipal banking person um, and it's through um, Hometown Bank, which is tied into East Hampton Savings. Um, the auditors and DOR and everybody recommends that you keep a tight rein on your credit cards. Um, as in the past, we've had incidents where things weren't quite controlled well enough and it ended up having late fees and things like that applied to it. So we are avoiding that situation by setting up these standards where everyone who is being issued a card is actually going to be in the possession of myself. They have to come in, get their card, tell me what it's for, and then return their card when they're done with it within like two business days so that we, I get the receipts back at the time that they return the card. Then I can match, when the bill comes in, I can match that up and get it out the door before any late fees transpire. So um, the reason why I'm creating a policy, I mean, that's what we're doing, but the auditors like to see something actually in writing. So this policy is doing that. And the only change from um, the policy that I had emailed you all earlier is item J. Um, it was just not worded clearly. So um, actually, Brian and Joyce made some suggestions about how it could be worded differently. So the individuals, except for myself, have $1,000 um, limits 
on their cards. Mine is 5000 So if somebody wants to buy something that's going to be over $1,000, I'm the one that's going to have to buy that. So, you know, it also kind of helps with like procurement issues if there's anything there that needs to be addressed. But my credit will be the one that will go, anything over $1,000 will go on my credit card instead. They're all tied to the same account. It's just each person has a different credit. Um, and I've also limited it so people can only charge twice a month because otherwise it gets totally out of hand. And basically, I'm just asking that the board approve the policy. Um, it's mainly to protect us. The, each employee is going to have to sign off that they receive the card, they've received the policy, and they'll act on according to that policy. So, and individuals who are not one of the six, mm -hmm. um, they would go to you. They would go to me. Okay. Yeah. So someone from the house, if they have housing to be handed. For what you know, yeah. picking a random. Yeah. They would just go to you and say, "Hey." Yeah. This is what we want to purchase, and this also because our we're already set up under under the credit card is tax exempt, so that's the other thing that helps. Um, we won't, don't have to worry so much about those issues. How often do you see this being used? I, you know, originally it was set up for extenuating circumstances, but um, it seems because of the restrictions on different things, like even our um, host for our website, we have to charge that to. So it probably gets used maybe four or five times a month. So we're using it now. We, well, we have been using it. We had a, a, a different card, but I've canceled that one because that was a nightmare. And <laughs> this one we've had for about a month, and it seems to be working well. What company is this one? This one's with Hometown East Hampton Savings. They're, they're combined. The previous one was a Unibank, but it wasn't set up the same way. So. Now can you, who's, uh, Social Security numbers on all these accounts. Cards. Each each card has each individual Social Security number. So if they if they didn't want to use their Social Security number, then they couldn't get a card. So it is under each of the Social Security numbers. I did ask the bank, um, you know, are, are, is anyone's credit is that is the Social Security number going to be used? Um, for their personal credit purposes, and they said no, it's only for an internal tracking within the bank. Okay, and can you, can you access all of these six cards? Like I can go online and online? see what people have charged on each of those cards, yes. Okay. So, if because we live in the age we live in. If Equifax compromised our credit card, town credit card, all six of those social security numbers will be compromised as well, correct? I don't think so, because they're only top. I was thinking of it from the employee's perspective. I don't think so, from what I understood from my banker. He indicated that they're only using it for internal control within the bank. Right, but it's in the system, so if they're It happy, isn't, they're yeah, the bank is, but um, yeah, it's not the, it's. Originally, they're not reporting that information to Equifax. Right, right, right. right. The other option is the employee not to get a card and just land buy everything on her card. Right. With my social security number. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I'm just kind of curious because we should ask that question. Yes, no, I asked and it said, um, and we were concerned about that. The previous card I had, they did use driver's license numbers, which was better, but this particular card would not, they wouldn't authorize them without the social security number, so. And none of the, none of the employees seem to have a, a difficult time with that, so. And so each of the employees can access their card information online as well, as well as you, or are you the only I'm one? I'm the only one. <clears throat> so 
So they charge, they don't know. They can't tell what's on, okay. Well, they they I'll will. Receipt, they they have to give me a receipt, whether receipt. it's an online purchase or right. you know going to a store and purchasing or whatever. They have to give me a receipt. Right. So. As far as in checking to see when you paid or if you paid, they have to ask you directly to go yes. physically pick up the card. They have to, yeah. They have to physically pick, and also they have to. We process the the payment for whatever they have purchased. So. Um, we do up the, the uh, bill schedule, and the check is produced. And we're doing that as people are buying it. So um, we will have a bill schedule for maybe two purchases and, on one check, and then maybe two weeks later, the next bill schedule, we may have another purchase. So when we send them to the bank, it may be two checks rather than just one check. But they're all ready to go when that statement comes in, so we don't have any delay. That's the big thing. We don't want to have that delay. And, and so how does it work? Let's say, I'm going to pick on Keith because he's sitting here. Let's <laughs> say Keith goes over leader. Well, yeah. I'm just, Leader's not a good example, but yeah, I understand. Okay, <laughs> a, a random guy to go store. Yeah. The, their debit machine, their credit machine, Mm -hmm. will pick up the sales tax exemption from the card, or is this an after-the-fact removal of sales tax? Sometimes it is after the fact, but basically each of us is, is always giving the tax-exempt certificate at the time of the purchase. Oh, so it's not the card. You're still carrying that. It, there is a possibility that someone, we've had that happen before, that someone will have... Uh, tax charged on it. We in turn, like if it's through Amazon, we could, they're set up with us. We have, right. our account number is set up so it's tax exempt. Um, if it's, if it's another company, then it's possible we could get tax. Um, at which time, the employee, if they don't take care of that tax exempt situation up front, the employee will get stuck with that tax because the town cannot pay that tax. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so it would get dumped from the next paycheck? Well, they usually have, they just, I mean, most of the time, we aren't talking huge dollar amounts for any, I mean, most of these purchases aren't huge. Um, so, it, but it behooves them to make sure that they're tax exempt ahead of time. Okay. <laughs> I'm okay with this. Okay. So would we accept the policy as uh Okay. Second all those in favor, yes, aye. Any opposed? Okay. Moving on. Thank you. Next scheduled appointment is Jan Ammon. Amin. From Amin from Franklin County Solid Waste District. Writing us an update. Well, good evening, and thanks for, for having me. Um, I've been at the Solid Waste District for um, double digits now, 22 years. And I, in those years, have gotten to build relationships more with the folks running the transfer stations um, and town administrators or town managers and um, had less time in front of select boards. So I've been kind of on a circuit. Um, yeah, I, I made enough copies for me. Um, so, so I've been traveling around the county to meet specifically with um, select boards because I see your signatures on contracts, but I don't ever see you folks. Um, oh, I met that transfer and I and I communicate frequently with uh, Fran Fortino and Brian. So, considering uh, that you're, you're a little behind schedule, I won't spend. I'm going through all of the programs and services, um, except to say that uh, the way we work is we have um, administrative assessment-based services, which are um, on the front page, and those are things you pay your assessment. Those are things that every town uh, member town gets. Um, one of the things that you just recently got through the grant writing was the paper compactor. That's an annual DP grant. 
Um, we also, you folks host our Clean Sweep collections. Uh, we do those twice a year. Um, and then we're regularly in the schools and, um, you know, uh, just the day-to-day -day things that it takes to help towns manage their, their, uh, their solid waste. The other, uh, and this is, you know, similar to the COG, we're, we're not, we're kind of a sister agency to the COG. We're not connected to the COG in any way, except we, we like each other. Um, the fee-for-service program is how we balance our budget. Uh, so the assessments pay 65% of our overhead, and the remaining um, operating costs are raised through fee-for-service programs. Now, interestingly, um, despite several attempts over the years, the town of Waitley does not use our hauling, most transfer stations use our hauling contracts for recycling and trash um, services. Because you're so close to Hatfield and Dave Wickle's um, facility, I just can't beat your prices. So when I go out to bid every three years, I put the town of Waitley on there and we look at the pricing and um, it's never better than what you get directly and I'm fine with that. Um, my goal is to save you folks money. So uh, the other fee for services that you do participate in, the number four, the household hazardous waste collection we just held at the end of September, um, and, uh, and you folks will get a report pretty soon. I'm, I'm waiting for the bill to come in for that. And then I just last weekend did the transfer station inspections, and you have two closed landfills um, in town, one on Long Plain, and I think the other is Weber, Weber Road. Um, mm -hmm. Not much to inspect, um, except getting to getting to walk around a little bit. And um, the only thing with the landfills was I asked Keith about mowing them in the fall as well. Um, they have to be mowed annually, and they're mowed in the beginning of the season. Um, so the, the Weber Road one was was fairly long. Um, the other handout that I gave you is probably the more exciting. Um, well, not probably is the more exciting. Uh, information. So all of the recyclables uh, collected at the transfer station, all the paper and bottles and cans go to the Springfield MRF, the MRF. That stands for Materials Recycling Facility. And twice a year you folks get a check um, based on how many tons you ship to the uh, Springfield MRF. The contract is um, expires in 2020. It's a decreasing flat rate. So January to June, you were getting $10 a ton. So if you go down to Waitley, you shipped almost 58 tons of paper and bottles and cans. You get a flat 10 bucks a ton for that, and then there's a revenue sharing component. So if you go over to the um, third dollar column, you can see the average of what you made in those six months is actually $17.81. Take away the $10 flat, flat fee, and the revenue share was um, $7.81. Um, the next column shows a public education fee. That's an annual requirement for every town. Uh, 78 towns that use that facility have to pay a five cent per capita public ed fee. Um, and that money comes back. We get, we get um, the information about buying signage for towns or um, different containers or uh, public education materials that we buy for, for the county. Um, this money goes into your recycling revolving, your recycling revolving account. Um, can be used for recycling activities, it can be used to pay for the hazardous waste collection, um, any district activity or transfer station activity. Any questions on that? I'm kind of going quickly because I know you're a little behind. So I tell people I can talk about trash all night, but I'll limit it to uh, just 10, 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. The reverse side is uh, more exciting for communities. Um, this is a program that DP started in fiscal 15. It's called the Recycling Dividends Program, or RDP. Um, and it's reminiscent of a very old program um, in the 90s where DP is trying to incentivize communities to make, to, to, to add components to their waste management system. So you get points for certain, um, jumping through certain hoops, <coughs> having certain programs, and every point is, uh, has a value attached. 
it used to be last year it was two hundred dollars a point. They raised it to three fifty um, for they apply in June for last fiscal year services, and then you get the funding. Um, so you get the funding in uh, you'll get the funding in FY eighteen. So if you look at Waitley, um, the the last column, uh, PAYT is pay as you throw. So DP really pushes that program. Um, and almost every town in the county has pay as you throw, so you get four points. You have a swap shed for two points. You collect food waste, you get two points. Now, the next one, bulky items. You don't collect bulky items, but there's a caveat that if you post on your website um, private haulers that pick up bulky items year-round, um, then you can get the point. So somewhere on your town website, and I have to verify to DP every year that it's there, it lets residents know they can call some, some local, some pretty small local folks and have their uh, bulky items picked up. No points for yard waste. Two points because you participate in the hazardous waste collection. Um, you don't collect a minimum of seven the next, the next row um, automotive waste, but I convinced DEP to give towns points because Greenfield has all of those services, and Waitley residents may use the Greenfield Transfer Station year-round. Um, there's a $5 non-resident fee, but if somebody uh, needs to get rid of something uh, in the middle of the year and it's in between our bulky waste collection, they can go to the Greenfield Transfer Station. So you actually get points for that. And then the textiles is the <coughs> Salvation Army box. Out of 16 possible points, the town got 14, which is a uh, number of towns got 14, but that was the highest. $350 a point. So you recently signed a grant agreement for um, $4,900. Once those get countersigned by DEP, um, they will direct deposit that $4,900 uh, to the town. That money can be used um, and I, and I think some of the money from previous years was being used to pay the town's share of the um, paper compactor, but it can be used to uh, make any improvements at the transfer station, um, signage, uh, lighting. Um, it can be used this year to buy co recycled copy paper. That's a new, a new thing that um, we kind of pushed. It used to be part of the program, and they did away with it, and now it's back. Um, so again, this is, you know, because your town is doing such a great job in offering so much at their transfer station, um, you're getting, you're basically reaping the rewards um, for that. The, what has gone away, and, and I don't know if you uh, remember signing the paperwork for this in the previous years, every town used to get $500. It's called a small scale initiative grant. Uh, towns bought blue bins or um, kitchen compost pails, or we had these re have reusable bag, grocery bags. They did away with that grant and increased your your point um, value. So you used to get two hundred, you'd get uh, twenty eight hundred dollars and a five hundred dollar small scale grant. Now you just get forty nine hundred dollars. You can still buy blue bins and compost pails and. Earth machine, backyard, you can still use this $4,900 for that. You just get one uh, pot of money instead of two. Um, so very exciting. Good, good work. The transfer station, I did the inspection. It's really well run. We have a good, good group of attendants. They keep the facility really clean, and um, everything looks really great down there. So hats off to, to the town for, for, for doing the job. Would you guys help us with a recycling marketing campaign? The reason I ask is that I'm just doing back of the head math. And it strikes me that per capita, Gil does more recycling than we do. Keith does more recycling than we do. And again, this is back of the head math, so I could be, I could be wrong. Um, and I, and I guess I'm wondering how we can how we can encourage mm -hmm. our residents to do an even better job with their recycling. Yeah, I think this is per capita. Well, I'm just looking at in terms of the, the public education fee is five cents per capita, so that's oh, just okay. the basic math. Okay. Yeah, 
Waitley, I mean, I can look at those, I can actually run those numbers, but Waitley has one of the highest diversion rates in the county. So you're, what I didn't hand out is I have a whole sheet that shows how much you trash and recycling you did in calendar 2017 and what your recycling rate is. Mm -hmm. And you're at over 40%. The county average is about 32%. Um, and I can tell you for a fact that Heath does not recycle more than Waitley. It doesn't? Because um, I'm, I'm just doing the back of the head math and it just looks They don't. Right. They're, they're, they've, they have probably about a, they've had like a 28% recycling rate. They just went to pay as you throw, so that will change. Okay. Um, so I can look at the numbers. I'd still love more, to do it more, an initiative more. because the national average for recycling, last I checked, was about 38%. Possibly. Um, no, that seems that seems high for the that seems high for the national. But it would be cool to to get to 50%. Mm -hmm. And how do we how do we challenge our town to really step it up mm -hmm. and do better than we already do? We have to lower the costs because we have so many private pickups now, so they don't bother recycling. The cost per bag. Yeah. But does it does that count against you if if people if half the town uses a private recycler are we still counting all their trash as no the we don't recycler? I can't track that I can yeah. only track what goes what goes one through. of the things that happens with those privates is they don't require or they don't mandate that there's their customers recycle mm -hmm. so if they did that many of those people that are just dumping cans and bottles in their household trash would then maybe, not saying they would, but they might decide to separate them and bring them to the Waitley facility mm -hmm. instead. But right now, they're not mandated, so they just, very simple, put everything in one big bag and throw it in a trash. And, and shame and on not those companies to, to not mandate that. And they don't. Yeah, it's actually against the law, but it does. So they, don't, they don't. They don't get caught because it goes into a big, yeah. big truck, and it's really, it's a backward system. DEP um, penalizes the landfill for accepting it, and we're slowly telling them, no, you have to penalize the hauler because the hauler is putting it in their truck and bringing it to the landfill. It doesn't have anything to do with it, you know, or the or the incinerator. Because Dan, I honestly don't think that our trash cut fees. No, no, you're cost. asking how. What, what, what right, you think lowering the costs. So that they would stop using Correct. private hauler and use us. Right, because I don't think too I'm not saying we're too expensive, yeah. but I'm just, that was one avenue. Yeah. You right. asked for us, you know, you were yeah, yeah, throwing yeah. out for a suggestion. Right. The Maybe. reason they're using the private haulers is. Well, what does the private hauler cost? More. Well, it'll cost yeah. more, more, but still. You're buying it's a convenience. That's a convenience. Uh, That's a convenience. Yeah, right. you know, I'm just. It's yeah, just a thought. These I mean, numbers don't include private haulers. I have no, I have no access to that right. information. So, um, the only numbers tonnage I can get is what goes over the scale at the MRF and what um, Dave Wickle's weight slips add up to. Um, I call them every year and say, "Can you give me the tonnage for Waitley?" Um, so that's that doesn't show the trash tonnage doesn't show. All all these numbers come from is what goes over the scale. Um, so. I would say actually that you're doing uh, an excellent job. Can you do more? Can you get 50%? Absolutely. And I can work with the waste management committee. We can see what we can come up to. And I think if people knew or they just had an idea that we're doing this much and we, you know, let's do more. Is anybody at 50% in the county? No, Leverett's pretty high. Leverett's, I think, at about 47%. Nobody's, nobody's hit the 50% number. Okay, yeah, cool to be the first. <laughs> We do advertise in the scoop. Is it every year? You come up with a with a one page yeah. schedule yeah. of what's acceptable, yeah. what isn't, and, and yeah. the dates of There's different collections. Yeah. And all uh, that. I think our, our solid waste committee does an awesome job. Of they, getting oh yeah, I'm not saying they don't. I just and they get, no, no, yeah, yeah. just gives it. You just want to give them a shout out here because they, you know, they're they're always on time with getting something into the scoop, so that people yeah. can, you know, any changes that come around every year, we get a new thing to post on the inside of our, our uh, kitchen cupboard door for checking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then before the spring and the fall bulk UA stay, there's a big article with lots of yeah. information answering all your questions. They, um, they take the, the, the huge amount of information that can sometimes come in for the town newsletter. I'm like, Fran, he gives it uh, the, the right, you know, he sorts through it and gets the right amount that we can actually fit in. 
So yeah. they're, they're, really they're really awesome. And and you know to, to give a shout out, uh, Quint Dawson and mm -hmm. um, Ronnie awesome. Ronnie Williams um, are your reps to the board, and they're they show up. They're people we can rely on. They participate. They represent the town really well. And uh, you know, Quint does a great job down at the transfer station too. But um, overall, you know, you folks really get the A plus. And um, I'm happy to figure out ways to to make you do even better. Percent. Yeah, what, is, what happened I, with the, the effort to collect large plastic containers and whatever? Oh yes, the bulky rigid plastics. So. Um, what happened is that uh, a lot of that material was going to China, and China uh, basically stopped accepting imports of recyclable products from the United States. So waste management, who does that, um, runs the, the recycling facilities, found a, a domestic market. Um, but instead of taking things like toy, like every, you know, you could put oh, plant pots and toys um, the domestic market wants about five things, which are five-gallon buckets, laundry baskets, um, milk crate kind of things, and lawn furniture. Maybe there, and there's one more. And so we've decreased pretty significantly the um, variety of materials that can go in there. Um, I emptied everything from the bulky waste collection by hand into that trailer, so there's still a lot of five-gallon pails and lawn furniture, you know, broken plastic chairs and crates in there, garbage cans. Um, but it's, uh, the, the scope has changed pretty dramatically. Um, yeah, so. Otherwise, that doesn't get recycled with the plastics. That go, the, bulky, the bulky ridges go separately uh, to the recycling facility, and they get bailed separately. And but that's only at the bulky waste day. Right, no, right. the town takes bulky rigid plastics year round. Oh, they do. Oh. Yep, they just ask people to put things um, on the ground outside the, okay. the roll off. It's the roll off in the back of the facility, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. and then that way the attendants can make sure nothing goes in. You know, things don't go in there. I can't. They just don't take as yeah. the multiple types of bulky waste anymore. Right. Yeah, plastic. Yeah. And if anything looks like you're making a good compost bucket, they set it aside so that somebody can actually just reuse it yeah. instead of yeah. so. Yep. So, thank you for, for the time, and um, Brian knows how to reach me, and certainly if you have any other ideas or questions after this evening, we're here to serve you folks and help you. Thank you for your money. Thank you for your help. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Oh, here's right here, look. Bulky items, companies offering pickup and disposal right there on the transfer station page. Okay, moving on, old business, uh, town hall project update. Brian? So, <clears throat> last time we met, we were waiting for Mass Historic Commission to sign the grant agreement with the town, which has been done. Should have done the pause for dramatic effect, but it did take a while. Um, the contract uh, with Westfoot Construction has been signed. And um, they provided their uh, payment and performance bonds today and proof of insurance today, and we're reviewing that. And we're going to have town council review as well. They still need to provide a, a builder's risk insurance policy to the town before they begin. And we'll have our first pre-construction site meeting um, next Tuesday, October 31st, with uh, Westfield Construction and the, the uh, project manager, George Scholl. So. Okay, cool. We are queued up to go. Okay. Okay, next item under old business is MIIA risk management grant program applications. In your packet there's a, a spreadsheet a spreadsheet and the application of what this small grant program is about. And these were some of the ideas that I had received. Thanks. That one right there. Five additional CCTV cameras for the police station, and these are in no particular order. Backup cameras on the fire trucks, portable messaging sign, work site lighting towers, entry system cameras for the town offices or town hall, and I also noticed this uh, sprinkler testing is a eligible expense, uh, eligible um, 
grand activity. Yeah. Can I, would be, just, I would just spread the test in person. Can that be a, at town buildings as well, other than elementary school? Can this building apply? Uh, any municipal building? building? Any municipal building that's, um, yeah, any municipal building. So why wouldn't we just do all the municipal buildings instead of just elementary school? Unless there's a yeah. cap. Well, that's, that's the building with the current. The building with the problem. I get that. I get that. We could do it for all. Why don't we do it for all of them anyway? Yeah. So it says five additional CCTV cameras for the police station. That means there must be at least one there right now. That was my understanding. I need to check with Jan, but maybe. Okay. And your works, your worksite lighting tower, uh, kind of similar to that. I, I thought one time we talked about the, the speed limit sign. There is the one. Speed limit sign. Police department already has one. Police we have one. Okay. So we see that very right. often, but. We don't Wait, see it anymore. No. Okay. I saw it. They bought a cheap one. They got one of the diplomacy. Is it you don't see it out very often. It's they more diplomatic right. than. But are they oh, solar they powered? They have the generators right here, built right in the wagon. Oh. They should be solar powered. They're solar powered ones. They have solar. Ours, you have to plug it in to a charger. It right. lasts about a day and a half. Okay, so what do we, we need to pick what? One of these or two? Or well, one? I mean. Last year we, we, we submitted three and they funded one. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm not positive that number two backup cameras on the fire trucks um, is eligible because it relates to our liability insurance. Our liability insurance, we have a separate insurance for police and fire, injured on duty. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that would be eligible under this. So that means okay. that under the, going back to the, the speed limit, signs for a second um, putting adjusting those for solar capacity probably would not be eligible under this grant we'd have you so you, you have to connect it with the risk reduction. Ri risk reduction right and we'd use it more because it would be more cost effective because we don't have to plug it in and use electricity I, yeah mm -hmm. you know okay the uh, Do we have any worksite lighting towers for where we have like a down tree across the road at night? Do we have any at all? Only what's on the fire truck. Oh, okay. So if the vehicle is there. How much would that be used, Keith? Um, it's hard to say because of it. there has been situations where it would be good to have a, a light tower, but right now I can't. It all depends on what we have for catastrophes. Um, right. Sometimes it, there has been situations where we've had incidents, and the fire department will have to well, that, that fire truck will have to remain on scene for a long period of time in the darkness, just providing just light. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Okay, the, the cameras for the town buildings, Brian, would, would that affect our insurance? In the buildings, would that make any difference? I don't think it would make a significant difference, though. In, in terms of how much we pay in yeah, premiums, we're paying premiums. Probably, probably not a whole lot. Would any of these um, affect our premiums, do you think? Yeah. No, not, not, a, not a significant, not significant amount, amount, but... but um, uh, I mean, the idea is, is that you would have less claims because of these. So for the, the, let's say the lighting towers, you'd have the chances of having a, a workman's compensation claim because somebody got hurt because they couldn't quite see well mm -hmm. or less because now you can see well. Do any yes. increase our operating costs? Some of them would. Such as? In terms of additional electricity. I mean, additional, if you're operating additional cameras, mm -hmm. presumably at some point software goes out of date or camera breaks. Yeah. I just think that the cameras in a, in a town buildings would, would be worthwhile because, you know, this building to me is out in the middle of nowhere. There's meetings here at night. I don't know what goes on uh, mm -hmm. after hours and whatever. And I've been here sometimes, this evening meetings, and 
There's nothing, nobody out there other than you in the car. Yeah. Uh, not that a security camera is going to protect you, but at least it's there if, if mm -hmm. an incident happens, yeah. you're on, you're, it's recorded. And I think uh, something happened at the school, I think at the elementary school, I know there are cameras at the entrance because there's mm -hmm. some times of the day when you have to get buzzed in and they All are the looking yeah. to see. Right. That's just to gain access. Yeah. It's not yeah. anything out in the Right, right, but there's a camera to see who's at the door. So. And, but there's not, they're not recording that. It's just a Correct. snapshot in time. Correct. And I think they're... Oh, they're, these would be recorded. Well, some of these, I think the technology is there for the cameras to, to only go on when there's a motion, time with motion detectors or put lights on with them, so they're not all, on all the time. Yeah. And well, even, even to check them remotely, if uh, Brian wants to check them before he comes in, because something looks suspicious, I, I guess he could look on his iPhone or pad or whatever. Now we're getting, we're, now we're getting, we're, now we're getting fancy. We're, we're putting yeah, some of it early so we can monitor what goes on when there's yeah. trash all over the place. Then we know, oh, don't say you didn't leave you trash all over because yeah. guess what? You did. And they can be, they can be um, programmed to take pictures at different intervals. Um, because if you take it every 30 seconds, the car's going to fill up fast right. and it's going to be ridiculous. But you can do different things. I mean, so, so the entry system part of that would be, would be at least for the front door, some, maybe some type of key card system. I'm not sure you, how expensive those are, but... Yeah. Oh, I thought it was just cameras. It's entry system dash cameras. So it's like an entry system and cameras. Is this due, like, today or something? It's due uh, 15th or something. November 2nd. So it's so, yeah, this it's meeting. So, I, yeah. I like the sprinkler testing thing. That feels like a real risk that we have. A real risk that we know we have. Yeah, and, and it's clear that it hasn't been happening to the testing. So <laughs> let's... Right. <laughs> um, that's, that, that's only a, a one-time deal, though, right? You're only going to test it once? Is that... Yep. No, it's it's be? Yeah. Oh, it's just once. It's not ongoing. Well, it's a pull. So the grant's limited to ten thousand ten thousand oh. dollars. Do we know how much it cost to, to um, test the sprinklers at the school? I don't know offhand. That was kind of my hand. I don't know offhand how much it is. Or in I'm sure place. someone would do it for ten thousand dollars. Well, in, in this building, were they tested before we purchased it? I'd have to look at the. I'd have to look at the inspection report. Well, and it's going to also depend on whether there are. They're wet or dry, I guess, right? In terms of how how frequently they need to be inspected? Well, that or how you inspect them, I guess, or test yeah. them. Mm -hmm. right? I, I'm not very familiar with that, um, but I could find out by a phone call. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. My, my preference is, is the entry system cameras, and you said the, the key cards to get into the building, and then maybe put number six sprinkler testing. Yeah, I guess I'd do the reverse just because we've got Exhibit A right now. Yeah, yeah I mean, testing. if we, we, we get to kind of pick three that we put up and someone else really decides, right? Okay, Probably. But, but won't sprinkler, if we have a, one of the buildings is having issues with sprinkler, isn't that going to be tested anyway? So, or somebody going to test it anyway? So what, what are we left with testing for sprinklers? This building and what? What else do well, we have? That's it. Uh, the There's elementary no school. The no, elementary but I'm saying, but the elementary school, school is going to be running. tested anyway. Well, to, I don't know that for sure. Well, there's <laughs> issues with it, it's, so it's going to be tested. It's going to need to be. It's going to be tested, so we're only talking of testing really this building. That's the only other one in, in the town owns that has sprinklers. Well, I see it written here. This is specifically for reducing property loss at the elementary school, where we have had sprinkler problems in the past. And no, I'm not as confident as you are that they're being regularly tested. Well, they are going to be now because there's issues with the sprinklers. No, no gonna, I, I don't agree with you. It's going to be, it's going to be tested. Then when they're reinstalled, they're going to be tested. But that, right. then what about going forward? This is what's got us in hot water already, is that we have, they clearly haven't been tested. Okay, but, but how long is this money gonna, uh, available for? Is it? It's, I mean, it's a one time. You need to spend, we need to submit invoices. By June. Was it by June? That's what it was for me. 
grants must be invoiced or paid. It's even sooner this year, May fifteenth, twenty eighteen. Schools, so it's going to happen fairly. Yeah. And then they actually put in, I know they're talking about upgrading and doing new things with the sprinklers. I just don't remember if that's already happened. No, no. I, I was going to give you an update if it happened. The time to start update is that um, I'm supposed to get a proposal next week from a fire protection engineer. Mm -hmm. Is it Rybach? Ry mm -hmm. Engineering, I think, is the firm. We need to do some more detailed analysis of the existing system. So, I mean, obviously... So they may, we may not have a system ready to test by May 15th. No, we, that system will not be... Yeah, so maybe for that reason, then it, that wouldn't be a good one for us to ask for now. Could I, could I just ask a yeah. question? Yep. This is a list that the collective people in town put together. Right. If this is for risk management, or mitigation of, 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 you know, could we apply to have this grant go towards the ultimate purchase of a new sprinkler system? Yeah. Well, we need to submit invoices by May, whatever. May, to what, May 10, Well, but then, again, it would, it would be just offset more, part of that cost. Could it yeah. offset? I mean, I, uh, I'm happy to ask that question. Because that's a cost we know we're going to incur. Yeah. And I've got to believe that if we don't have a sprinkler system in the elementary school, um, we're at risk for property damage. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's worth, because again, we know we're going to incur that yeah. cost. And it's going to be a couple dollars. OK. If we, so if we put, uh, I mean, we, we get to put things in the hat, and someone else gets to pick. So if we put five and six in the hat, so it's just being pending, Brian's going to ask a question or two to see if the sprinkler system uh, will work on that timeline. Um, what would be a third thing that we'd want to put in the hat? And let's assume that, that, that there is a way to somehow, if we were to get it for sprinklers, use it to offset cost or use it in some right. way. Um, assuming Brian gets uh, some confirmation of that. I, I probably would argue for the the lighting, just in case something does happen, so that if the fire truck is being used to light work being done, and God forbid we have a fire, we don't lose our lighting. Yeah. Because it just doesn't seem like the ideal purpose for a fire truck is to light. Up. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. If they're there, yeah, if they're there anyway, they're if they're there anyway. Buy a light tower for ten thousand feet. Think That's so. Much, right? I didn't price it up. Who priced that one? I don't have pricing. It was uh, Lynn's idea. Yeah, her and I had talked about it in the past. And... Well, I mean, yeah, because we don't want to buy something that's going to add to our cost. I mean, Dan has a good point. But if that would cover the cost, rather than having a fire yeah. truck, because the fire truck might be there in the immediate, but. Be. They won't, it won't be there after the emergency is gone, while the repairs are going on or what have you. So I, I think that's pretty good. But I'm just one guy. And would, would, would that be so, solar? Well, you don't know if it's solar or not. No, no, no. Probably a uh, diesel it, generator. Generator with the... 10,000. It's not going to be solar because you're going to need it at nighttime. Night well... You want well, the backup battery? That's yeah, yeah. that's going to exhaust the battery. It's, yeah, it's, like that. it's too bright to. Uh, yeah, to you're not talking serious, serious wattage. wattage. Yeah. We get even LED. even maybe nowadays they are coming up with some pretty decent LED ones. Yes, but the LED ones would be good to get, but regardless of whether right. you're running it off generator right. or off uh, solar charge. But bed. usually they just run on like a five or a seven k generator. Some maybe this, maybe this, ten, but yeah. somewhere in there, and they're. They're the same thing that you see out on, on construction yeah. jobs. They're just yeah. a little trailer unit with a stand up, and then you crank up the mast. And it comes on with one element. The light with the generator comes together. Yeah, all yeah. one unit. Right. Yes. So is there a way to find out in time for, um, for well, the due date for this, for, to find out if, if 10K is actually a reasonable price for that? Sure. Okay. Oh, definitely. All right. You can make phone calls. Let's do those three. Let's do those three. And, and if, if, for some reason, numbers four or six or cannot 
uh, be submitted because we find out that they're too expensive or that we're not going to be able to do it on the timeline for spring or test. We'll give Brian uh, one more that to put in if one of these others is eliminated. I feel like he's the, the runner up who gets to take care of uh, Miss Americas. Uh, so, so what what do we get so far? Is it four, five, five, six? I think we're okay, right in priority. Are we giving five first? I think that's. Can't I don't think we get point. to give them priority. Do we? Do we get to give them our priorities? I mean, we could. I don't know how much. I'm missing the entry system camera thing personally. I, I don't quite grasp it, but. Uh, yeah, I, mm. I myself, it, uh, not, well, not the cameras, too, I don't really want to be part of the Big Brother, but I can understand at a facility like this that it, it might be, you know, a security for yeah. the, for like the amount that we're investing in our uh, uh, people and our stuff here. Right, yeah. so I guess I would, I would suggest that we do four, five, and six, and if for some reason four or six we find to be non-plausible, we don't add another one because those are the three that we really want. If we add a third, they might pick the one that we really don't want. Really, or we can least utilize. Yeah. So that'd be my okay. okay. Okay, that sounds that sounds reasonable. But, in, but let me just in addition to the cameras, I think that was a card or some kind of entry system here as well, rather than having keys all over yeah. the place. So we can turn off cards. Yeah, and that will yeah, right. and that will be well, we can, but it's expensive. Yeah, but that will eventually add some expense, right? As you have to make new cards, and when the grant runs out, there'll be some, probably not huge, but some ongoing cost yeah. for that. All right. Okay. Uh, The next one you saved me from bringing up on my own. Calvin. What's that? The health next insurance. one you saved me from bringing it up on my own. Oh, yes. I want to tell you health insurance is next. Old business? Health, health insurance. insurance. What's it's next on our yeah. agenda? Let's provide an update as to what's going on. Okay. So as you know, the, the town purchases group health insurance mm -hmm. for its employees. And Currently and historically, we purchased it from the Hampshire County Group Insurance Trust. Um, for many years, the trust and I, uh, myself and the, the other four town administrators for, from Frontier had a meeting with Joe Shea to discuss some of the specifics about what's going on. For many years, the trust had what he called um, good loss or good claims runs or good loss runs, and that's where the trust was taking in more money than it was paying out in claims. The trust is a, the trust is the actual insurance organization. Blue Cross Blue, Sh Blue Cross is the third party administrator. Um, so their reserves built up, and the way that they returned those reserves to um, the member units was that they didn't make many changes in their copays. Um, over the past year, over the past several years, and they were able to keep premiums lower than other insurance organizations did during that same time period. So their reserves have slowly dwindled to a point where the trust feels that it can't continue to subsidize or or pass on or absorb those costs. Um, and what the trust voted to do was to make uh, changes in the plan design. And as I understand it, the basic of, basically what, what they voted to do is that the plans offered through the trust don't charge a deductible currently, and they will not charge a deductible uh, going forward. That hasn't changed. Um, they did vote to increase the co-pays for office visits for primary cares from $15 to $20 and specialists from $15 to $40. Uh, they increased co-pays for emergency room and hospital stays. Did they don't say what they are though here? Um, it's on the back. I mean, it's very it's on, the, on the sheet here. Emergency room that was 75 went up to 100 Inpatient admissions, there was no copay. That's they voted a five hundred dollar increase. 
surgical daycare previously didn't have a, a copay that's changed it or it's proposed to change to $250. There was no cost or no copay for MRI, CT, PET scans, those types of things. So imaging testing, there was no copay. That's the vote was to change those to $100. Prescription drugs. The current plan didn't require a deductible. What they are uh, proposing is that there be a $100 deductible for individuals, $200 deductible, and that's a retail deductible. So it's when um, a subscriber goes to CVS or Walgreens as opposed to mail order. Um, and they would pay the deductible up until that money is exhausted and then the deductible will go away. That's my understanding. But if they do it all by mail, it's, there's no deductible? Yep, so there's so you see there's a split here in terms of the copays increase a little bit, retail. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um and then mail goes up. One of the biggest increases that that Joshe told us about was in terms of, of pharmaceuticals. That was that was by far the biggest uh, cost increase that the trust has seen. Mm. What are your comments on here pertain to which plan? The savings to premium, if you go with the Hampshire County one? Which, your, your table, your notes on here, what do these? 6% savings to premium. I think that's Lynn's handwriting. That's Lynn's handwriting. What do they pertain to? Okay, so those are a little bit different. If these, if these changes, and again, this is information I'm passing along, if these changes were not made, the mm -hmm. projected increase if these changes were not made, premiums would increase 10%. That's the projection. Mm. Okay. If these changes are made, then the projected increase to premiums would be an increase of 6%. I've heard 5%. 6% savings to premium. Has anybody done a side-by-side -side analysis on, on what this would mean in terms of out-of-pocket -pocket cost comparison for the average insured? Because obviously, if you use the insurance, and I assume that most of the people that we are insuring are using, they're going to the doctor, they're doing, they're using some of these things that are going to realize a, a, a fee increase. Has anyone done a side-by-side -side analysis of whether the 10% increase in the premium would be, how much more would it be to the average user? I have not seen those calculations. Wouldn't that make sense so that, so that our employees can understand what this will mean to, to them as an average individual? Because if, if I'm using a lot of these services because of family health issues, yep. and, and I'm looking at this and saying, I, I, I don't know whether this is in my best interest for us to do that it's incomplete information. But I, mean, I agree. I agree with you. At, at this, and we don't have. We don't have. The towns have not been given the complete information in terms of. We don't have any cost. We don't have any numbers about the premiums. Why not? The premiums because in. Blue Cross and Blue Cross has not given them to the trust yet. They're supposed to get them in December. So, but how are we voting? How is the trust making this decision without complete data? I, I can't speak for them. Um, mm. well, so they're starting to change. And I don't right know. If, I don't know if they. Have, I don't know if they have additional information that's beyond this. This is all that I. This is all that I have seen. Um, but but you're right. So let's take these two scenarios. One, there's no plan design changes. Ten percent increase. That hits everybody, right? Yeah. It hits the towns. It hits everybody equally. Healthy. You know, people who use the insurance are going to get hit. To what? I mean, we don't know what even the. Average yes. premium is right. So but the you increase, but you increase copays and lower premiums. That burden, we'll call it, that additional cost, is shifted to those who use the right. service, as opposed to those who do not use the service. Absolutely. So the people who are, who I absolutely agree with you. Yes, but there's not users and non-users. Everybody's going to use it eventually. Eventually, yeah. Right. And and that's so. I I, I don't really Both buy that good. argument. So much. I mean, I understand that people with children who have to go in for a yearly exam are going to, on average, use it more than someone 
who doesn't have children. But um, that I think that argument doesn't well, it doesn't hold completely. Why? Well, the 25 year old who's, who doesn't have a family is 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 not going to use right. these services as, as often. And so they're going to look at this differently. Right. No, no, right. no. I, I, I they're going to pay that. less in premiums. The, right. that, the, if they do the plan design changes, everybody pays less in premiums. Right. If we don't, if they don't do the plan design changes, everybody's going to pay more in premiums. So that 25 year old is going to pay more. And it, it, it also encourages people not to go for every little thing either. Right. If well, that's something I, I that's something I had, I had brought up. But in terms of in terms of health outcomes, if yeah. if I have to pay a hundred dollars for a for MRI, maybe I hurt my knee. Maybe I say, well, it'll get better. Right. Okay. Um, so, right. so it, it goes that, back to what, is that this conversation with Zach about yeah. managed health care, and there's no great. So, like, I guess my question would then be. Have we done a side by side of, between the new plan, the proposed plan, which is what they want to adopt, yep. and the state insurance group? All of that stuff is required. Is what? Yeah. All of that is required. There, there, there's, there's, yeah, you're going to get, meaning we don't have the information now, but before we have to make a decision, those, that's the kind of information we'll have. Right. Okay. Be because we have employees in this town who are feeling like nobody's communicating. And they feel, and I, whether it's valid or not, that's what they feel, yeah. and and that's not fair to the employees. But right now, because we don't have all the information, we look like the ones who are withholding information or or, or being non-communicative. Should this go to the personnel committee? Just no, because I don't think the per I don't think the personnel committee has a, has a, has the mouthpiece. There. We need to communicate with people where it is. Well, and they don't feel like we are right now. Well, we can refer them to FGAT because they know the same information as we do. Right, but my guess is that, that a lot of our employees don't necessarily live in Whitley, so they may not have access to this. No, no, it's online. Well, same I, as I, I get it, but okay, Brian, the difficulty is I, I take issue with, with, how this, with how this rolled out, with how this took place. It was this initial push from the trust to Notify the unions and vote to change your plan. And it really made people nervous. It goes back to the summer. And it's all steps that we, in the end, didn't have to take at that point. And we, and, and we didn't take. Um, we just voted to, you know, we voted to adopt the law that we will eventually likely have to follow. But we didn't, the town didn't, the, the board didn't take an intent, you know, didn't vote an intent to change our plans. Um, I think eventually we will have to by the fact that the plan that we have today is not going to exist come July 1st if the trust makes changes. Right, so this 10% um, increase if we keep the plan, it might not even exist to keep. The, the, the town, the town mm -hmm. purchased, we purchase our, we purchase our group health insurance from the trust. So the trust defines what the product is, the, the health insurance product that we purchase. We don't have to buy from the trust. We could buy from Maya. We could buy from no. I understood. Whoever. I understood. But, it, but I'm, I'm hearing that even though it says we might, if we want to keep our current plan, there'd be a 10 percent increase in premium. Well, we uh, could. And, and all, but also saying that that we could, we can't keep this plan because it probably won't exist. Well, that's 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 the choice of what the trust is going to offer for plans. So the trust is going to offer. The, as far as I know, the trust is the trust is doing this. He's doing the ten percent. No, it's doing the, the, the changes. Six percent. So oh, the changes it, with it the six percent. to six percent. But this, the increase is still six percent to the premium. Yep. Just instead of ten percent. Right. But the thing you circled is the current plan. I have two. I have two things circled. I know. Isn't that good? But you yeah. just circled the one that is the current plan, and you said this is what they're going to do, and you circled the current plan. I'm sorry. Current plan. Right. Is the first I understand column. that. Right, and yep. you're saying, I'm hearing two different things. I'm, I'm hearing, sorry. this plan's probably not gonna be offered. And I'm Correct. also hearing 10% increase if we keep the plan. So you think that the right-hand column is what is going, what they will adopt? Yeah, that's what they voted to do. Which is the 6% increase in the premium plus any user fee, any user cost. No, 6% savings to premium. To the premium. 
See, so, I'm really this is it's a six percent increase as opposed to ten percent increase. It's it, it's it's savings to the to the premium. The it's going to go up regardless. No premiums going down. Right. Well then. Yeah, Why does that's my understanding. I, this well, is, this is just a uh, a note that was put there. Okay, then I think we might have to ask the, no, the notes taker because yes. I would not have used the word six percent savings to integrate the prices going up. Well, that's like federal budget. That's well, the way it works. But, but, well, but it's just, this is Lynn. Lynn isn't the federal budget. Okay, but they're making up with uh, with the deductibles here okay. and a, and a different. Uh, payments for each activity, so that's why they can afford to give you a savings in the premiums. They don't have to increase the premiums as much. Right, because, because you're they're going to make, make it up, up with But the, they are going the to cost. increase the premiums at some level. Right. That's um, my understanding. Right. So, and for people that don't use the plan that much, that's the benefit because their savings, or, or the premiums are going to be less. If you use the plan a lot, well, then you're going to pay more. You're going to pay more up until well the, until you reach the out of pocket. Do you guys want a visit from Joe Shea? Yes. Okay. Because I guarantee you this is going to bite us when it comes to collective bargaining. Yeah, maybe. When the contract is up, this is going to bite us. I guarantee. Yeah. And if it doesn't, they have a lousy union rep. I, I and, guess. And, and if he's coming, then maybe the people that you're talking about who want more information could be also given the heads up that it'll be at the meeting and yeah. it might be worthwhile for them to hear yep. what he has to say. Under civil discourse. Under civil discourse. Because that could get boisterous. I guess I would, I would like to see what how they come up with the savings to the premiums. I mean, if Lynn did it, what is she comparing? That's, that's from the trust. I'm what, sure Joe could provide that. Whether the numbers are comparing, I guess I'd like to see it either for the existing, for each one of these, what are they saying the premiums are? And I'm sure they've ran some number of scenarios for the premiums for the proposed one to see whether it's it's worthwhile or not for the company, yeah. and you know whether it's proposed or draft or whatever. To I'm sure they have proposed because they've got to be able to give us an average weekly employee, and this would be the impact to the average weekly employee, the 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 six percent savings premium, whatever, however that's defined, and then what out-of-pocket costs will be incurred by that average weekly employee over the course of the year between deductibles and co-pays, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They've got to run those numbers. That's why they hire actuaries. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know if aver average employee is the correct term. It's going to be one single or, or family or single plus one, whatever term they use. Yeah. I, yeah, but, I haven't but seen an average different, employee. Di but. No, different employees health situations are different. So you take, right. the, an actuary would take the average of that and just say, okay, this is this is ballpark what it's going to, how it's going to impact. And then some will impact less and some will impact more. That's the definition of an average. Well, I guess I've never seen that for any insurance plans I've had or been into. They, well, I've never seen the average, you're, you're average not, impact. It's either one, two, or one. You're not, two. you're not. <laughs> so. But let's say, you have a family of four with two kids, and I have a family of four with two kids. Yeah. My two children may go to the doctor more often. Yeah. They know we're still paying that same premium, but I'm still going to pay more out of pocket right. because. Right. So my point is, is that they know of all the pool of employees in Waitley, what the average impact will okay. be. Okay, if they know that, fine. They must know that. I don't know. That's how they run their number. That's how they make, create their budgets. That's no different than using what average tax bill is going to go up in the final weight. Right. Well, one might go up 100, the other one maybe, might go up okay. 300. But the average is going to be two. Right. At least it's something to throw a dog at. No. I'm sorry. Are we clear on which ones? I'm, this one's this one's the one that they're, this is the current one that they're voting. Okay. That they voted to. So, so, so you're going to do away with, yeah. So you're going to give more information at a... Well, I can, I can ask Joe Shea to... to yeah. Yeah. In my communications okay. with the offer to come. Please. Okay. Is it illegal to offer employees an incentive to go on to their spouses program if possible? We've discussed this many times in the past. <coughs> no. And it's, the answer is it's never been Is it illegal? No. I places believe do it that now. Some places do it. There already are places that I don't do know it. it's legal or not, but you think you can provide financial incentives. Offer but that's going to be taxable, obviously. Well, offer five, save 20. So you're up to five. Right. I mean, right now the town is spending about, what, 14, 
15, 14,000 for a family plan, somewhere in that range. So if you offer the employee well, but, but I guess our current, those are the things you have yes, it's going to impact the town, but we also owe it to our employees to, to make them very much aware of how these discussions are going to impact their day-to-day -day lives because of their bank account. And so while we need to have a conversation about how the town realizes this bill in terms of how, it, how it's budgeted, we also have an obligation to the employees so that they are fully aware of the pros and cons of this plan and what we're going to do to compare this plan versus other options that, that may exist out there. So there are two separate issues. Right, but whatever you, you, you come to is going to, as you mentioned earlier, Jonathan, the premiums keep going up every year and plan benefits probably go down. So. There's going to be a compromise somewhere, and and I think employees, uh, employers got to, you know, employees got to realize that it's going to change one or the other. It's not going to stay. Right. It's going same. to change. It's yeah. going to change. It's going, we, something we can't going to keep change. it the same. Right. Even if we went to a different same. policy, it's right. going to change. Right. But that's the communication right. I think they're looking for as well. Right. Okay. Okay. Let's keep going. Okay. Uh, new business highway department hiring senior operator laborer and an operator laborer. Brian? So with Ronnie retiring, they created a vacancy at the, um, the foreman, which we're calling the uh, senior operator laborer position. Mm -hmm. um, so the select board is the hiring authority for the highway department. So um, we received approximately 20 res I think it was around 20 resumes, 18 to 20 resumes. For both positions. For both positions. So we advertise for the senior operator laborer and the entry level operator laborer position. Um, so Keith, myself, and Jonathan interviewed. Well, we offered interviews for seven people. We ended up interviewing five for various reasons. People, um, people dropped out, but didn't show up. Um, so we interviewed five candidates and we met on two different, two different occasions to discuss who we thought would be the best in those roles. And we unanimously um, recommend that Tyler Mankowski be offered the position of the senior operator laborer position. Mm -hmm. And that, um, oh, and that uh, Brian Belder be operated the entry level operator laborer position at the highway department. Oh, is this like little Brian Belder? How old is he? His son, Chucky. The little one, the one who like was younger than my kids yeah. in the elementary school. So he'd be. Oh, so I'm that would. So Brian would be the new. He was such a cutie pie. Like, Brian would be the new employee, and we have we have one. You have one other one, right, Doug? So it's just going to be three employees under your. Right. right. As it was. Um, As it was. Okay. So I would make a motion to accept the recommendation okay. from. That group. And I, 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 I second. I second that. Okay. All those in favor? Yeah. Aye. Anybody opposed? No. Okay. Moving on. New business. Winter parking ban. We need to vote on that. Winter parking ban. So I want to make one change to what I had. So the winter parking ban effective November first. 2017 until April 1st, 2018, unless sooner lifted by a vote of the select board. The ban prohibits the parking of vehicles on public streets and in municipal parking lots between the hours of 12 midnight and 7 a.m. All right? I think so. All right. That's municipal parking lots and. Right, so people can come. So cars in the municipal parking lot overnight. Um, so after 12 o'clock, the police department will come home. It's so what happens if Brian's working late here? That would my car. <laughs> he would have to move his car? Potentially, yeah. I mean, it's, it's overnight parking is what it's... Right, but if he's here at 1 o'clock in the morning because he was negligent in his duty before, and he's scrambling. Well, there's a big snowstorm on that again, that's the over. <laughs> no. So but it's only going to be enforced if there's a big snowstorm. It certainly would be in a situation where 
in the past, it primarily just refers to usually the post office town hall parking lot. Okay. When the person who comes to plow the snow can't do his job because the vehicles are there. If there's a situation that you just mentioned where someone needs to work here long hours, they're going to be here. They can go out and move their vehicle while the... Right, so it's not, it, it's not the, the sky is clear. It's, it's enforced when there's a snow emergency. Yes. Right. It's not January 3rd. No one's going to bother them on a crystal right. clear night. So you, you're more than welcome to work till 1 o'clock in the morning. Unless it's snowing. No, we have the car. Would we have issues yeah. with the town hall parking lot before then? Oh, definitely. Yeah. In fact, a lot of what tends to happen is, like, a, like an example, is the house across the street. Their driveway tapers down from the road. Their, their tenants know that they may have trouble getting out in the morning. They'll come and park their car in the town lot and leave it there overnight. Yeah. And want to get up and go out and take off at 8 o'clock. Well, in the meantime, it's been in the way for the snowplow operation. So the police department at that point in time can be contacted and they'll authorize it to be towed. Okay. And you guys are the ones who contact the police department? <clears throat> Most cases it's been the water department employee because that's who's the one that plows the parking lots. Not so the they like department. check before the snow gets too deep that there's cars going to be in the way and get the tow truck in before this. Yeah, and I'm not saying that sometimes the police department might Oh. Go there, run the registration, find out who it is, and ask the dispatcher, can you notify them, and if they can make contact, get your car out of there, so you're not going to, it's not an automatic, right. it's, they try to work with the, oh. the owner too. So, so, so on, on a clear night, when someone's using the parking lot for overflow parking because of their holiday party, they're safe unless it snows. Correct, and again, it... Okay. It's more after, 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 after 12, so yeah. Same thing, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, so motion. motion. Okay, second the motion. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Very opposed? No? Okay. Uh, KP Law Multiple Representation Disclosure. If you would consider signing these. Yeah. I read it over, it just basically says that. Um, because for anything related to South County EMS, they're also representing Sunderland. They don't anticipate it'll be a conflict. If it ever looks like it is, then they'll basically quit both of us and we have to get a different attorney. Is that a That's reasonable summary? Yep. No, um, I think I'm fine with that. I, I don't think our interests are conflicting with Sunderland on anything to do with South County EMS. Okay. That sounds like a consensus. Yes, everybody agrees. Okay. Yep. Uh, moving on, uh, shared mower financing agreement. So this relates back to Eversource and the shared mower program, where at least the lead town and Eversource is, um, we entered into an, a contract with Eversource to provide us uh, $26,000 a year in payments for five years to finance the mower. Um, but we need to buy them over. Um, so this is the, the financing agreement that the town needs to sign. Um, it can be signed by the chairperson. There's about Seven. eight different things he needs to sign. So Fred was willing to stay after it to That's sign these so if you guys want to look at it. But we can say uh, yeah, I don't need time. to sit through Fred's signature though. Okay. <laughs> you want to verify my signature? Okay. Okay. Uh, Next item, Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District. So we received a letter from the town of Deerfield, and there is a movement to create a, you guys can guess what it is, Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District. Um, I'm not sure, I, I don't really have a recommendation. I was wondering if we should have somebody come in and talk to us about what the proposal is. Um, again, we received this 
Yeah, whatever. It wasn't we, actually tax, like a, but it's not health committee. We have a health agent, and don't we have a um, board of health? What do they think of this? Or do, have they seen it, or do they? Have I don't any? know that they've seen it. They should. They might be. Um, I, I mean, I'd like to hear what they have to say about it if they know more. But it might be something we should learn more about if we're going to have to ask to make a decision about it. Yes. Yeah, I mean, this is adding to the cost of our. Or to paying for. I won't get into it. And, and who's the. Is it Carolyn who. I would assume so. Who I would ask to come in and speak with us? Well, yeah, but, it, but if Carolyn comes in, and it's great to have her, but we should have the Board of Health. Well, here. right, yeah. And whoever else is representing us currently so that we make sure that there's no overlap in, in services and we're not paying for duplicative services. Yeah. So, there's not really any action to take, but I wanted to mm -hmm. pass that along. Okay. Put it on the back corner. Next time, Mill River Bank Stabilization Project, cost overrun grant. So we applied for a cost overrun grant, and we received it. Oh my gosh. Did so, our cost overrun? Yeah, I don't recall that. Uh, Forty thousand one hundred twenty-six dollars in cost overruns. Okay. That FEMA is paying us. It probably caused them too. So, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I was trying. I should have kept that in my thought. So we're getting an additional. Can you repeat that? <laughs> we're getting an additional forty thousand dollars from FEMA to reimburse the town for some cost for the cost overruns. Beautiful. Oh, for cool. the most recent Mill River project. Where do I send? I've done calculations from fiscal year 2012, and we don't even want to talk about how much the town has spent on. I want to go down there and visit. Does this catch us up now? Where are we out, like 140,000? Depends how far back you want to go. Yeah. Don't, don't, go don't, don't do that, Dan. It just gets worse. And these are all uh, Fred signatures again. Okay. So. All right. But why does this letter talk about 75% reimbursement? Uh, is because it 40,000 the 75 percent, or is it 75 percent of? Yeah, I think the letter is a little confusing. If you look at the contract itself, the amendment is for the 40,000, 40,126, which is probably not part of the letter that I sent. Well, it is, but it says and will be reinforced up to 75 percent. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't think that letter is right. The contract is to increase the amount of the contract by 40,126. Okay, so that's the total. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Moving on then, town administrator updates. Didn't you already do them all? Well, I was supposed to talk about the Frontier Bond meeting, meeting, remember? Oh, yeah. yeah. It was a long meeting. Oh, sorry. Everybody. There were some folks who were there. You care to. I'll, I'll let you. You want to start or you want me to start? Yeah. I, if, if, you, if you miss the general sentiment that I felt, then I'll chime okay. in later. Was there a entire select where you go? No. I was uh, having some back issues, I so I was there. not there. I was there. We, yeah, I was there. We had what five? And, yeah, five and I had at least one person from the school committee. Maybe two were there. Um, no, my wife. Two or three from from finance committee were there. No, there was five. There was four. Four. Finance. Yeah. Did they have a room for everybody? Yeah. 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 They, yeah. they stuck us in the Leaky Media Center so we'd all oh, vote for the bottom. During the rainstorm? During the rainstorm. Oh, <laughs> uh, God. Good yeah. timer. Um, so, so, so it was a meeting of, for a, a possible $3.4 million bond proposal, school improvement bond proposal. Um, my understanding of the next steps is that the school committee is going to um, pull together a subcommittee to further refine the proposal. Um, there was a wide variety of reactions um, in the meeting. It's actually it was just televised, so um, folks can go watch that if they want. Um, so what, what was your take? Well, my first take was not ready for prime time yet, but I would agree. they had to get out at some point and say, look, this is what we're thinking, and they needed the feedback that they got. And I think one of the big pieces of feedback that they got that I think they're going to listen to, at least I hope they are, uh, are things, I think Fred had mentioned it and a couple other people had mentioned it, to get uh, local contractors who care about the school on that subcommittee. You know, even if they're not school committee members, you can be a member of a subcommittee for the school even if you're not a school committee member. 
So to get those folks on there to help make it work in the same kinds of way maybe that the town hall committee worked. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, other people weren't even quoting that particular process. Um, but it, it was clear they didn't have complete information, so people were like, aha, you don't have complete, complete information. I was kind of going expecting they wouldn't have complete information. That they're, they're, they were you know, coming out at a point, they, were, they weren't out there with all their I's dotted and T's crossed um, because I think they needed some, some more feedback. Um, and that's, so I, even though I say not ready for prime time, that's not necessarily unexpected at this point. And that they, they know they have to go back and refine it. I think is a good thing. Um, the composition of that committee is going to be important uh, to, so that next time they're much closer to ready for prime time. Um, and because it, it, it is that we, we don't really put money in our budgets and tend to fund the day to day maintenance of things. You know, there, were, there was at least 15 years, the first 15 years I lived in this town, not a single capital project came up unless the roof was actually falling in. You know, only emergencies got funded, and that's the expensive way to do infrastructure. So I, I like that they're looking further out. Are there any criticisms of what they put in there? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> and and there, so 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 that's where that committee's really got a lot of work to do. Um, but uh, big picture, probably we need to put some money into infrastructure. Is it going to be three point four million dollars? I don't know. I don't know if that's where it is. Some of the things clearly we need, we really need to have more in all of our budgets, right? For for keeping our infrastructure up to date and, and in good repair. So, um, what were some of the big number items? I'm guessing there was some. Well, there was yeah. there was two full pages of. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there, there was a. Yeah. And again, I, I want to say, Dan, that I've looked at you know I looked at all this stuff, and I'm going to agree with Joyce and disagree. They're all at the same time. Because I wish they had packaged it better, better yeah. early on to to offset or to to, to 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 play defense against the the cheap shots. Oh, you're not ready. You know, they need to package this better. Um, but there are a lot of big needs. The one of the big ticket items was um, the the high school track. I mean, if you've seen the track, it's not good, um, and that was. Four hundred thousand dollars. Six hundred thousand dollars. Wow. But that's the same track that was laid when the school was built. I bet. You know, I'm maybe exaggerating, but there are some real needs because the high school is no different than, as I think Joyce Joyce alluded to. We all ignore our capital needs and we don't plan appropriately for it. Um, I, I do wish they had packaged it better. Um, they can compartmentalize it better. Um, there were a lot of head scratchers in terms of why it was. Anyway, there's a, there's a lot of unknowns, but yeah, they are need. They are big needs. Um, the other question that I had, looking at it from afar, and I talked with Brian a little bit about this, and maybe it was discussed in the meeting. Some of these elements, some some of these line items could potentially be paid for out of community preservation. And some of these item, items could be paid for out of green communities. And I think Katie was, was one of the people who brought that up. Oh, she did? Katie yeah. and a couple of other people stood up and said, hey, Sherry. you know there's green, yeah, Sherry from Sunderland. Well, there was, there was um, no discussion of funding sources, really, other than the, the total project right. amount. Yeah, so, but it was sold as a bond. It, it seemed to me that it was sold as we're going to have to create a, a bond issue. And, they, they, and you don't need that much money for the bond issue just because there are other ways to skin the cat. Yeah. Right. But they, so they so did, maybe it won't be 3.4 yeah. million. But they did, they did package some of the improvements. They had a handout. I didn't yeah. look at that in detail, but they did yeah. package yeah. the improvements into types of work, whether it was sports related, track, right. I mean, tennis courts, inside, yeah. eating, security, security, safety, safety related, stuff. But, yeah. but I think that. Even though the, the 3.4 million that they proposed, it could vary a million dollars either way, up or down, because the way they got the figures was was really skeptical, uh, no really support for it, and don't know if they even use prevailing wage rates for any of that. But at least there was a, 
a number that people can maybe uh, associate with what needs to be done. It's not a half a million dollar project, it's, and it's not a million dollar project, it's a lot more than that. And it gives them some kind of maybe ballpark range of what to look at. Uh, and and I, I think what what they should have should have done is, and I think Brian kind of agrees, rather than come up with the yeah, it was a good number, but they provided too much detail because to the public, because everybody is nitpicking every one of the twenty of the fifty yeah. plus line right. items, and you're never <laughs> going to get agreement on fifty line items, and the project will not be advertised that way as fifty line items, so you're never going to know who bid for for repainting the lockers. I mean, they got 25,000 in here and people are jumping up and down. Well, you just sand them and repaint them. Why do you need new lockers? Well, that's not the kind of input you need from the town, from right. the towns. It's, you know. They open the door for micromanagement. Yeah, from for towns. micromanagement yes. from the towns. And you're never, gonna, you're never gonna get complete agreement on that. You know, the, the one person from Deerfield, we know that comments on everything was up there with his laundry list of specific items. You know, and, oh, I'm not going to talk about too many of these. Yeah, yeah. and we <laughs> didn't we didn't do that for our our project here. We didn't go to town meeting and ask, "What do you think of replacing doors and all this?" There are some so, towns that operate their town meeting on a line item by line yeah. item basis, yeah. and that's why those town meetings take two days. Yeah, and, and we're I, not going to do it that way. And I, that's going to shoot them in the foot every time they bring that up, and I'm right. hoping that. Maybe the newspapers don't print the, the 55 line items that they're asking for. I don't know, we'll see, but... I, but, I, but and, and by the way, when we talk about $3.4 million, this is divided by four towns. Right. We, four should, towns, we need right. to remember that. This isn't right. the... Uh, that's just the bond, that's not the interest. So it's probably, I'm sure that's just right. the... Another the, the, year yeah. up to, yeah, four plus. To, yeah, four, <laughs> four million plus. Over four million total, plus. yeah, by the time you but it, interest. But again, some of this stuff can be paid for through community preservation. Yeah. Four towns of community preservation. And, and they also need to, if we're going to redo the track, how can we make it a community asset yeah. so that we promote wellness? Tennis courts. Let's actually have the whole community use the tennis courts as opposed to just frontier students. It's an easier sell that way. So that's that's why Joyce. I wish they had packaged it more appropriately to to build consensus. Like, yeah, there's yeah, they, there's they, a need yeah, for these yeah. things. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, no. I uh, we disagree less than you might think. Okay. Yeah. yeah. My, my sense is that is that if they're going to form this subcommittee. I think it would be great if they would consider getting some outside professional assistance yeah. in terms of prioritizing with the projects, prioritizing their needs, getting accurate cost estimates, and exploring alternative sources of funding, green community, CPA, um, that even if it's done, I mean, there's, there's nothing that says that you can't get a green communities grant one year, then complete the project, and when your project is done, go for another green communities grant, or, right. you know, maybe not the following year, but the year after. And, in green communities, I think they, they, they awarded something of the magnitude of $17 million last year for projects. Um, it's a significant source of funding. It really is. Uh, and and I, would, I guess I would encourage the schools to, beyond the finding the experts in various areas to, to be a part of this, work with finance and select boards from the four towns as opposed to just staying insular within the school committee members because we have the experience of knowing how to be creative with the finance and, and we want to help. Again, we need a lot of most of these things probably. There's no fluff here. Right. But we can be their friends as opposed to so I, I hope that they yeah that they are inclusive. Yeah. Like, like think of tax dollars as the the last resort for funding. Like right, and perhaps they'll be used, but yeah, right, my, yeah, my, well, the other options. Yeah, Sorry, they need to look at hiring somebody to get more credibility to what they're doing. Is one point I made, and the other is to look at a funding package. They have no idea mm -hmm. how it's going to be funded other than a bond. And and that's maybe the last resort to do it, but and and you know, it's a it's a it should be, and I don't know whether this was discussed or not, but I keep thinking we are in the age of school competition. And there's a reason that colleges, on a different scale, I get it, spend a lot of money on buildings and all that kind of stuff, because they're competing for students. 
and the students look around and they say, well, this school has this and this school doesn't have this. I'm going here if I can get in. And parents are looking at it. What's that? Parents too. Parents too, right. Yeah. So now that we are competing with charter schools and school choice and private schools, if we don't do these things and we just sit back and say we're going to become, we're going to, we're going to be static, we're going to be seen as being old and tired. And that's not a recipe for attracting students to the school district or families to the four towns who make up the school district. Right. Okay. okay. Uh, what else you got for him? Items. You, uh, you had one in here on, on veterans, preservation grants for veterans. Yeah. Collections, monuments, and memorials. Have you really seen any or got any response to this? Or? Um, I have a meeting with um, Jim Ross tomorrow morning to see um, if the veterans group has any ideas about what could be done with this grant. I've also reached out to the uh, uh, Darcy, one of the cemetery commissioners, yeah. to see if there's needs for the cemetery. Um, so by November 15th, it's a simple letter of intent. So um, I think we are meeting before the 15th, so we could, hopefully we'll have some project ideas to discuss. Okay. Well, the, the, the two things that some people mentioned to me is, is just what's there needs to be uh, updated. Not the monument stuff, but the, the seating arrangements, seat, the seats that are there. That's and, what Jim and I are going to talk about. Yeah, and the other tomorrow. thing is, is recognizing I think there's no recognition of, was it the Korean War or Afghanistan, Afghanistan War? There's not all the wars that are, veterans are recognized and that maybe should, should be updated with either another monument or, so, or some way. Yeah. We're doing that. that. The bushes are starting to overtake that well, little monument park there. That right. Well, I'll, uh, I'll we can use the sprucing up right next to the fancy new town hall. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, and I know. I, I, I'm pretty certain that there's needs in the in the cemetery as well for yeah. veterans grave markers. Veterans grave markers. Right. Good. So more to come. Okay. Anything else? Um careful. Uh, okay. Yeah, careful Jasper. Um Egypt Road has been paved, needs the lines painted on it, then it'll be all set. Is a is a telephone pole in the, in the final location? Yes. <laughs> it is. Okay. So was it actually moved? No. It wasn't moved. No. Nope. Okay, because I was. I don't know if they want to go down poles and pole locations. No. Okay, okay, but okay, but that that's it where it says okay. Um, we do need to consider. We do need to get um, thinking about a, about a special town meeting sometime right. the end of November, early December. Um, there's late bills to be paid. So like the 29th you're talking about? Maybe? Um, I'm not sure. Um, well, and it does dovetail with the fact that I'm pretty sure that none of the three of us, I'm going to be free to speak for my colleagues in hopes that I sway them. <laughs> none of us are going to want to uh, meet that last week in December. Yep. So we should plan, if we're going to have a town meeting, we should plan accordingly when we're going to have our select board meetings. It's not on your list. Yep. It's not, CPA you're right. There's so, some CPA items. items. Um, it, yeah, I would like to see either the 29th or the 13th, and, and, and I guess I'm going to talk with the building committee proposing additional money for the town hall. We've got some things that we need to consider yet, so, because the cost came in higher than what we originally thought, so. Cover some of those items. Right. So we may need some additional money to, to cover some expenses there, and to me that's a good time to do it rather than waiting mm -hmm. two weeks to schedule a special meeting and get finance approved if we need that in here, so. Yeah. Okay. I don't care which one. So. Is that it? I don't feel strongly about which one, but. That's it. Get ready for the 29th? I'm not sure we're going to be ready for the 29th, but. So probably 13th. Well, we'd have to approve the warrant by the 29th, right? And if I need we do to. it by the 13th, two weeks, right? We would need to do it by the 13th. The warrant would have to be approved by the 29th. Is it okay? So we got between now and the 29th to a month to. Yeah, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll think about it more. I just wanted to get that yeah. okay. in your mind. Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. Just in favor? Right. Good luck. Okay. Can we adjourn? Not everybody. No.